Welcome back. Um, today we are basically on endocrine system part two. If you're following along in your notes, they look like this on the front. And we're a few pages in, or we're on specific hormones. Page looks like that. Um, for this section, we'll be talking about um, pair bonding. Those are voles. Um, if you don't know what a vole is, it's sort of like a, uh, it's related to hamsters, kind of like chipmunk and mouse. So picture like, you know, a hamster, chipmunk, mouse. That's pretty much what a vole is. Um, so we'll learn about them. They are uh, monogamous generally, and some are not. And we'll learn about some of the genetics and the hormones behind that actually. So we'll learn about oxytocin and um, vasopressin, ADH, that explains these guys. Um, look at calcitonin and parathyroid hormone, insulin versus glucagon, thyroid stimulating hormone and thyroxin, cortisol, epinephrine, and then feedback inhibition, gone awry. Um, as far as these hormones go, you'll hear me say it a few times, but the College Board says that we don't have to directly know any specific ones, but they might use them as examples to illustrate a point. Um, the ones that are most likely to pop up would be insulin and glucagon, but anything is, is fair game. And I just picked the hormones that I thought would be most likely to show up if you're in some sort of college um, anatomy and physiology class or something like that. So um, we'll get started. And on our notes, we did growth hormone last time. So below it is oxytocin and ADH. We're gonna do those kind of together. And we'll actually start with ADH. So ADH is anti-diuretic hormone. So what does diuretic mean? So it actually means uh, diu uh, if something is acting as a diuretic, a chemical is a diuretic, it actually makes you pee. And then an anti-diuretic keeps you from peeing. So for example, caffeine is a diuretic. If I drink water versus drinking the same amount of water with caffeine in it, the caffeinated water will make me pee more later because it's a diuretic. Alcohol, for example, might also be, I'm not sure, but alcohol might be a, um, a diuretic. And so ADH is when you're trying to hold on to liquid. So if I don't drink anything for hours and I'm working outside, then eventually my pee is gonna be like disgusting looking. It's gonna be kind of yellow, orange, whatever. And um, that's because my body is releasing ADH, which is telling my kidneys, hold on to water. So ADH says, make your urine really, really concentrated so you don't dehydrate and die. That's why I have a picture of a guy on a camel, and he says, um, thank goodness for um, ADH. So um, if you've been drinking tons and tons of water, then now your body wants to get rid of some, and so then you dial back on ADH, you'd pee out more water. So this is one of the ways that your body, this and um, a few other things, but this is one of the ways that your body controls how much water you have or don't have along with sweating and stuff like that. Um, the way that it works in the kidneys is it actually will determine um, how many aquaporins you have in your kidneys. So your kidneys are constantly deciding um, whether or not to let the water go on through. You cycle, um, I wanna say, a long time ago I read it was something like close to 200 liters of liquid cycles through your kidneys a day to be future pee, but then your kidneys reabsorb you know, 198 of it. And so you pee out two liters and you keep 198 if you're drinking enough water. So ADH is basically controlling the aquaporins that determine how much water are you pulling back in to your system. And ADH is a crazy looking organic chemical. Looks like that. It's always fun. We should have a t-shirt made out of that. And if you were in organic chemistry, again, if you're going to major in chemistry, obviously, or biology, you'll take Gen Chem 1 and 2 followed by organic 1 and 2. And in organic chemistry, there's a whole new set of naming, kind of like you did naming with like phosphate, phosphite, nitrate, nitrite in chemistry. In organic chemistry, there's naming too. So this is actually antidiuretic hormone, also called vasopressin because it controls vessel pressure, blood vessel pressure, vaso vessel pressin pressure. So your blood pressure. And that's actually the official organic chemistry name. And so that's why they just call it vasopressin. Because instead you'd have to call it that. 
Now you might not even be able to see that, um, but man, there's like 20 different numbers in there. So it's pretty impressive. Um, and what's weird about organic chemistry, a quick aside, is if you gave this to like an organic chemistry professor, like that was their thing, you could give them that. And based on all those numbers, you know, like two amino, that means the second carbon on this, on this, on this, has an amino group attached to it. Um, if you gave them that exact name, they would all draw the exact same picture. Like every line would be in the same spot, every double bond would be in the same spot. Like that, that amino group would be right here as opposed to right here because otherwise the name would be different. So you can actually go from this naming to that. That's why organic chemistry kind of gets a rap as being difficult because in gen chem, you're just trying to figure out like how many of each atom. Here, I have to have a set of words that tells me like what the molecule is really going to look like. Kind of crazy. So we just call that antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin. Well, it turns out that um, vasopressin, oddly enough, something that controls blood pressure, partly by regulating how much water I let in or let out. Obviously, if I'm peeing out more water or holding on to more water, that's going to change how much water is inside of me and inside of my bloodstream. So that could control my blood pressure to some degree. Um, so it turns out that ADH and oxytocin, the hormone right above it in your notes, um, are both linked to pair bonding. So it turns out the bulls, again, I can't remember what I called it a second ago, the uh, chipmunk um, mole rat or whatever, um, they pair bond and I, every source that I see, I don't know if they're all quoting the same study, I don't know how many studies have been done on this, but supposedly less than 5%, the number I keep seeing is 3% of mammals are actually monogamous. Um, so like in these studies, they're basically trying to figure out um, why is it that particular types of bulls, not all of them, there's prairie bulls and other types, uh, meadow bulls, and um, why are some monogamous and some aren't, and is that something that we can like change chemically? Can we make basically a one night stander type of bull that, you know, goes out with like, you know, a lot of buttons unbuttoned and stuff like that, and um, can we turn him into like a faithful good guy that'll hang out with the kids and, you know, do chores around the, the bowl hill. And so anyway, um, it, it's interesting because, like, one of the things that I'm sure you guys are interested in is, like, us humans. Are we in the 3% that are monogamous or not? So anyway, back to the bulls. In the bulls, this is a, vaso, um, a vasopressin study. They basically have the prairie bull and the meadow bull. So the prairie bull, those are the ones that hang out together. That's why there's like a couple over here. That's a boy and a girl. Um, I don't know which is which. And um, so in their brain, in this little brain slice right here, they're showing where vasopressin is binding to the receptors. So you probably can't see it extremely well, but that part's dark. That means a whole lot of receptors are filled up with vasopressin. So picture I've got receptors and I've got vasopressin and vasopressin is dark. If I have 10 receptors and they're filled with vasopressin, then it looks dark. But if I have 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 receptors filled up with dark vasopressin, then they'll look darker. And so that's kind of what you're seeing is you're seeing receptors that are full of vasopressin. And so um, these guys right here, they're pair bonded. Uh, metal bowls, kind of a single dude. Again, he's kind of the one night standard sort of guy. And um, it, Turns out that he is lacking in the receptors. So what they did is they went in and genetically modified these and they essentially took a meadow vole and then gave him the receptors that these guys have to see if they could make him behave like him. So let me kind of run through that again. These guys are monogamous. This guy is not. He's just out trying to score wherever. And can we by changing the receptors in his brain, turn him into a monogamous guy? And the answer is yes. So you might not be able to see this graph extremely well. I'm gonna zoom in on it quite a bit. So right here, you've got the regular prairie bull, 
So what percentage of its time did it spend with its partner versus just, you know, the strange? And so this one spent, eh, it's a little bit hard to tell, almost 70%, you know, of uh, its time somewhere around there with um, its partner. Whereas you get over here and it's more like 25%, so maybe that's 75, 25% with a stranger. So we'll say three to one, 75% um, to 25%. The meadow um, in these arrow bars don't overlap. Um, these guys right here, the meadow vole looks like he's spending about 20-ish percent of time with a partner and maybe 10. So he's like two to one, but I'd say that's half. If, if that's three to one, that's two to one. But then when we take the meadow one and we give him tons and tons of genetic modification, we now make him, um, I don't know, six to one, um, preferring to be with a partner. <clears throat> You'll also notice that this guy is a loner in general. So the reason that these don't add up to 100 is because he's not with a partner, he's not with a stranger, he's by himself. So he's kind of a loner. Uh, he'd actually do well um, in modern society today with uh, distancing due to coronavirus. So a little coronavirus joke. It's not too early for that, is it? So back to these guys guy and gal, um, we basically can inject a female with oxytocin. That gives her pair bonding not only with her spouse, if, I don't know if voles get married, um, but not only with her um, partner, but also with her children. And so the idea is you can take a um, vole that has had a child and she'll be releasing a lot of oxytocin and she'll pair bond with her child. So she'll groom her kids. She'll hang out with her kids. She'll cuddle with her kids. Um, you can take a virgin vole and take her and put her with somebody else's kids. And she doesn't give a crap about those other people's kids. Um, but we can take a virgin vole and when we give her an injection in her brain of oxytocin, then now, so we switch to oxytocin um, from ADH vasopressin. And now what happens is whenever we inject that into her brain, she starts like basically being motherly to other people's kids. And so oxytocin might be <clears throat> the major, one of the major pair bonding um, hormones for mother and child as well. I have no idea. I'm just talking. Um, but you might have heard of postpartum depression. Sometimes mom gives birth to a child. And yes, it was painful, but I have this glorious child and this is wonderful and my child is beautiful and I love her and all this. And other times you're like, I'm not feeling the feels like that, that was a lot of pain and I've got this baby and, you know, I, I love her, but like, I don't, I don't feel the love kind of thing. Um, there are various versions of postpartum depression, but maybe it's an oxytocin thing. You don't have that just immediate rush. Um, so that's pretty interesting. They went in and they did a study on humans. And now again, we're kind of bouncing back and forth. Um, now back to vasopressin, ADH. Um, that was the one where we did this study. With humans, they went in and they found a receptor. Here in a little bit, I'm gonna show you where some of these links are in case you just really wanted to read more about them. Um, but we have AVPR1A, this is in humans. And essentially, there was this allele, they call it allele 334. And if you have it, so a lot of times we'll say with um, genotypes, we'll say like big A, big A, or big A, little A, or little A, little A. Well, sometimes you just say like plus plus, meaning you have it. So if you're like plus plus, that's, that'd be like homozygous dominant. Plus minus, that's heterozygous and minus minus. So they went in and they basically surveyed um, couples and asked them a few questions. They asked them, and I'll just read it off the screen, have you experienced marital crisis or threat of divorce during the last year? And then the couples answered. They would answer individually. And we could predict what your answer would be based off of your genotype for allele 334 for this vasopressin receptor. So that AV, let me make sure I get the name right, the AVPR1A version is a vasopressin receptor gene. And based off of 
basically how many copies you have. Are you big V, big V, big V, little V, or little V, little V? We can predict um, your marital happiness. Um, the second question that they ask, and then I'll give you the results. Um, so the first one was, have you experienced marital crisis or threat of divorce during the last year? And the other one was um, frequency and column-wise percentage of subjects being married or cohabitating in the three groups. So basically, are you married or are you living together? And what they found was basically if you were this, then you were happy in marriage. And if you were this, you were not. So you heard that right. Recessive, recessive actually means that you were happier. So those that were, um, those that were plus plus or plus minus, 85% um, said that they have experienced, oops, hang on. Sorry, this way. Have you experienced marital crisis? No, 85% said no. Um, over here, it was 84% for plus minus, and then 66% for this. So let me change that, made a quick error. Here, you're good, you're good, and no I'm not. So again, what's the likelihood that you've experienced marital crisis? Um, I did not, I did not, 85%, and then only 66%. So if you wanna think of it this way, in fact, if I wasn't gonna like critique all my videos and everything else, I would actually pause and go back and fix this. I'd say it like this. How many of y'all have had a marital strife? They say 15%, yes, 15%, yes, and then that means this guy over here is 34, so you're twice as likely, basically. So if you're minus minus, you're likely to be happy in marriage. Plus minus, you're likely to be happy in marriage. Um, plus plus, you're twice as likely to be unhappy in marriage. As far as married versus cohabitating, it was um, kind of similar. It was 83, 84, 68. Um, so who was more likely to be married? These two right here. This one is less likely to be married. Um, this one was more likely to be living with somebody, but not married. Again, I'm not trying to make social commentary twice as likely. It just... A stronger pair bond is if you're married. A stronger pair bond is if you're like, yeah, I haven't really thought about divorce in the last year. So my bond with my wife, would we would call it stronger if we hadn't been talking about divorcing. If we'd been talking about divorcing, I would say that our bond was not as good. We're doing great, by the way. Um, so all this in humans from vasopressin receptors. Who would have thought? Pretty interesting. Um, there is let's see. No, I don't want to say that or that. Okay. I did want to show you a few sources on these real quick. Hey, the first video is done processing. That only took forever. Um so here's the study. If for some reason you wanted to Google it. I'm going to put it in kind of some kind of sheet for references, but genetic variation in the vasopressin receptor 1A gene associates with pair bonding behavior in humans. And the author that you'd look for is Wallum, W-A-L-U-M. This one talks about oxytocin. Um, this is from a science journal, but it's called The Orgasmic History of Oxytocin Love, Lust, and Labor. <laughs> That's a kid. I don't know how well you can see that. Um, but this is actually a kid getting, uh, well, we're, we're going to get to that in just a second. He's getting UV radiation therapy, but we'll talk about like why in the heck would you do that in a second. And then um, here's, if you just click like prairie voles oxytocin, you get some pretty interesting hits. When a female prairie vole receives an oxytocin injection in her brain, she hovered with her partner more and forms stronger bonds. So all you need is some oxytocin. By the way, um, oxytocin, the synthetic version is called pitocin. And that's what we inject into women to induce labor. 
So if, um, let's say a female is going to give birth, like for whatever reason, I'm getting ready to go out of the country and, and I'm a female. And so I need to give birth like Saturday morning at eight o'clock. We can give you a shot of Pitocin and that starts labor contractions. Pitocin is oxytocin. So we always thought for a long time that that oxytocin never made it into the baby's bloodstream. Now we're starting to second guess that. We're now starting to see if kids behave differently when they're older based off of whether they were delivered by C-section or um, natural childbirth or um, if they got like a shot of Pitocin. Um, so a lot of that's kind of controversial, but just kind of an interesting read. So, so many ways we can screw up our kids. And then later on, we, we find out about it. Okay. Um, the next one that we wanted to look at, let's see, below that we have calcitonin, parathyroid hormone, insulin, glucagon. Let's do um, insulin, glucagon next, and then we'll come back to calcitonin and parathyroid hormone. So insulin, glucagon, like I said, this is the most common pair that a professor would just kind of like decide to use as an example. So the job of insulin is if I eat something, like an apple or almonds, um, and let's say it was higher in sugar, like an apple, then whenever my blood sugar starts to go higher, um, that can actually have some detrimental effects. So my blood sugar, you know, when I'm, my resting blood sugar, I'd like to be below 100, you know, maybe 90, something like that. And after I'm eating a meal, it's gonna raise some, but it shouldn't be like hundreds. And so anyway, my blood sugar is gonna start to go up. Well, as it starts to go up, then my body will release insulin. My pancreas release insulin. And so insulin is supposed to bring my blood sugar back down. Well, okay, if, if my blood sugar is going down, that means sugar is leaving my blood. So where is it going? Is like insulin destroying the sugar or, or what? Well, that's not exactly what's happening. So what is happening, let's get some purple and some green here. Uh, I'm learning which, which pins do and don't erase well on this board. Um, so whenever my blood sugar is going up, I release insulin to lower my blood sugar, but I'm not just lowering my blood sugar to get sugar out of my blood. Um, what I'm doing is I'm actually pulling sugar out of my blood and feeding my cells. So when my blood sugar is high, and we generally measure that as blood glucose. So when I say sugar, I'm implying glucose. So my blood sugar is high, then what we do is we release insulin. So let's say that uh, my blood sugar is going up, then insulin will knock it down. So insulin will reduce, insulin will reduce blood sugar. And when it does that, insulin will take sugar out of the bloodstream and shove it into cells. If I have sugar circulating around in my bloodstream, but I never actually push it into cells, then my cells are starving. So without insulin, your cells starve. So I feed cells. Well, let's say I still have some extra sugar because I didn't just eat like one bite from the apple or whatever. I ate, you know, like several bites. Well, any extra sugar, then I feed my liver and I store it. I say feed. Um, I store extra sugar in my liver in a substance called glycogen. And glycogen is just a polymer of, of glucose. So here's a glucose, here's a glucose, here's a glucose. I just shove them together, and there you go, now I have glycogen. If I shove them together in a different way, in a different pattern, then, you know, like the bonding is like this, let's say, then it's, then it's starch. And if I put them together in a different pattern, then it's chitin, that's like exoskeleton. But um, I kind of store it as this sort of, um, it's supposed to be oily. I've never like held glycogen in my hand, but it's supposed to be kind of like an oily substance, even though it's, I would, I would have thought of it as like sugar water, but I store it in liver. And then after that, if I have extra sugar, then I can eventually convert sugar 
to fat for long-term storage. And you might remember earlier when we were talking about leptin. So then, once I start storing fat in my fat cells, my fat cells release leptin, which go up and hit those leptin receptors in my hypothalamus in my brain, my brain will say, I'm full. So I eat some sugar, insulin will be released from my pancreas. Now, insulin is going to lower my blood sugar because it's taking sugar out of my bloodstream and shoving it into my cells. Then, once my cells are full, cool. Now we kind of top off the liver. That's like our, our storage, glycogen. And then once that is full, then I store the rest of my sugar. I convert it to fat, and I store it, you know, wherever. Okay, um, so that's what insulin is supposed to do. But what if I haven't eaten in, like, quite a while? Then... Glucagon is the opposite of insulin. So glucagon is essentially pulling sugar out of your liver and dumping it into your bloodstream. So I eat a sugary snack, apple, maybe I follow it with some juice so it's really sugary, um, and it gets in my bloodstream fast if it's liquid. So my blood sugar starts to go up, insulin will knock it down. If my if I don't eat for quite a while, my blood sugar is too low, glucagon, insulin down, glucagon up, insulin down, glucagon up. So we're always maintaining homeostasis. Um, and as long as I'm not diabetic, then my body does that on its own. There's a few types of diabetes. So type 1 diabetes would be if your body, for whatever reason, doesn't manufacture good insulin. So the common cause for that type 1 diabetes, we call it is that your immune system, it's autoimmune, auto, self, immune, immune, your immune system is attacking yourself. So it's attacking the um, islets of Langerhans cells that make insulin. And so now your body just doesn't make insulin. But the same result would happen if you just had like a bad gene for insulin and you didn't make insulin. For whatever reason, if you're type 1 diabetic, your body doesn't produce quality insulin or not enough or none at all. And so when your blood sugar starts to go up, it'll just keep going up. And as odd as it sounds, if your blood sugar gets too high, you risk infections because you're feeding microorganisms in your bloodstream. Sounds like BS. I've read it. It's that. So if my blood sugar is too high, one of the things that, that hurts me is I'm feeding microorganisms in my body, oddly enough. And so what we have to do is I would now have to inject insulin. I might have some sort of um, device that... I don't always have to give myself shots, the, an insulin pump, but it's going to have to release insulin for me. So basically what would happen is if I eat lunch and I kind of calculate, all right, I ate about this many carbs, then I'm going to need about this much insulin. So as I'm eating certain carbs, I, I need to inject myself with a certain amount of insulin. So I'm, I'm checking my blood multiple times a day to make sure that my blood sugar is about right. Um, if it's getting too high, I need to give myself more insulin. If it's getting too low, I need to get some sugar in my body pretty quick. Um, honey, juice, something like that. So glucagon and insulin are keeping me at a homeostasis. Um, type 2 diabetes, um, the good thing about that is we have some control over it. So type 2 diabetes is essentially if my body, if I'm eating too many carbs, then eventually my receptors for insulin start to downregulate, which means I might have a cell. So here's a cell, and pretend that that's an insulin receptor. Now, we wouldn't have five on a cell. We would have many more than that. Let's say that there's five. Well, if I carve the heck out of myself, if I'm always having big sugar spikes, for example, eating five apples um, versus drinking five apples worth of juice, if I eat five apples like this, it's going to take a while before that sugar hits my bloodstream because of all the fiber and other stuff with it. But if I just drink apple juice, it hits my bloodstream pretty quick. So I'll have a sugar spike. And so essentially what happens is the more that you're spiking your sugar up, the more that you're just eating like refined sugars, then your body will start down-regulating receptors, meaning my cells will start removing receptors from the surface. They're literally doing a, a version of endocytosis on their own receptors. 
And so now your body doesn't respond to insulin as well because I'm supposed to have five receptors responding to insulin and I only have three. So my body's not going to be working as well. That's type 2 diabetes. And um, the way that you control that is quit eating crap. If I can drop, like if I was, say, 30 pounds overweight, if I can drop 10, 15 pounds in body fat, then my body starts to go back and correct itself. So the way that you generally fix type 2 diabetes is stay somewhat trim. Again, you don't have to have six-pack abs, but you need to not be, like, overweight. Um, so do that and then also eat healthy. You can be pretty skinny and eat garbage. You know, if you eat 1,500 calories a day in, like, mocha frappuccinos, you're still going to be in poor health. Um, even though you might be really skinny because you're only eating 1,500 calories. Um, we also know that big swings, big spikes in sugar, we think, are linked to inflammation on the lines of arteries. And so we think that's how like diabetes might be linked to things like stroke and other things, is if the inside of my arteries are inflamed, then now fats and things like that, um, blood clots and stuff like that, kind of have something else to stick to. It's kind of roughening up my arteries. And so it's possible that um, having big spikes is causing inflammation, which then later on causes, you know, a stroke or a heart attack or something like that by clogging arterial flow. So pretty interesting. Again, glucagon and insulin is what they're most likely to ask you in just a straightforward um, college class or on the AP bio test. Now, if we back up to calcitonin and parathyroid hormone, they work kind of the same way. One says, you know, up and one says down. So if you look on here, it says that calcitonin lowers blood concentration of calcium. Well, if I eat calcium and I can absorb it, we'll talk about how I absorb it in a second. But if I have a bunch of extra calcium in my bloodstream and I need to store it somewhere, where do I store extra calcium? Yes, bones. So um, if I'm eating calcium, then we've already learned that we use calcium in muscle contraction neurotransmitter release. Um, so I'll be using that to run my nerves and my muscles and such, but I also need it for bone density. So that's what provides the minerals for bone, kind of the, the concrete part of our bones. Um, yeah, the hard, hard but brittle like concrete. Again, my house or Timber Creek or whatever is on a concrete slab. It's strong enough to like hold Timber Creek, but I can still go over with a hammer, just a regular old hammer and like chip a side of concrete off. So it's, concrete is strong but brittle. The calcium parts of our bone is strong but brittle. So with calcitonin, what calcitonin does is whenever my blood calcium is high, it's supposed to pull calcium out and store it in my bones. Parathyroid hormone, named not based off of what it does, like calcitonin makes sense. It ends in IN, so it's a protein, and its job is to grab calcium. So its name is based off of function. Parathyroid is based off of, para means like a cross, like on chemicals in organic chemistry, when chemicals are across from each other, that's, that's para, kind of like parabiotic mice. So your parathyroid, this is my thyroid gland right here. It's mostly wrapped around um, my, my trachea, but it's kind of peeking out right here. You can't see it, but I can feel it. And so my thyroid should be somewhere along in here. If I'm a doctor, I can tell the difference but I can't tell the difference between muscle and thyroid for me. But on there are these little spots called parathyroid glands, and they release parathyroid hormone. And parathyroid basically takes calcium out of your bones and dumps it into your bloodstream so that you can use it for muscle contraction and nerve impulses and um, or neurotransmitter release anyway. Um, so if I don't eat any calcium and my muscle and my nerves are still gonna work, then that means I have to pull calcium out of my bones and that's why my bones will be brittle. So that's why we sometimes emphasize that you need to get adequate calcium to build healthy bones. If I'm eating enough calcium, then I can run my muscles and nerves and still have extra calcium for my bones. But if I'm not eating any calcium, then I will run my nerves and muscles, which means I'm extracting that calcium from my bones, thanks to parathyroid hormone. So calcitonin, brings calcium down, stores it in bones. Parathyroid pulls it out of bones, dumps it into your bloodstream so that your muscles and nerves, among other things, have access to it. Okay, um, 
the interesting thing about calcium is our bodies are not very good at absorbing it as is. So if I just like ate calcium, I'm not saying this is calcium, this is an apple, but if I was eating calcium, uh, my body will basically just kind of crap out calcium. It's not very good at absorbing, but with the help of vitamin D, vitamin D is important because it helps me to absorb calcium. So you want vitamin D and calcium in the same meal so that the vitamin D helps you actually uptake the calcium that you're eating. Um, without that, you end up getting this. Does anybody know what this is called? It's an x-ray of a child. We're looking at the bones. Here's another one. And here's a very severe one. In this child, you can see the bones down there. This is called rickets. And rickets is basically when you aren't getting enough calcium into your bones, so your bones aren't dense enough to be strong enough. And what that means is if my bones are not very strong, the bones in my arms, they don't really have to like support a lot of weight all day, but my legs do. So if you think about my shins, they've got all the weight of everything of me from knees up on them. So if they're not very strong, they just kind of bow, they flex, you know, almost like a, like a bow flex. And so essentially you'll see something like this. So this is rickets. due to lack of calcium, um, which could be due to lack of vitamin D. Um, one last thing about vitamin D that's interesting is it is true that your body does take cholesterol, a version of cholesterol, and has it near the surface of your skin. And whenever UV light hits it, that catalyzes a reaction that actually makes vitamin D. So being out in sunlight, like actual UV light, um, does help you to make enough vitamin D. Um, does that mean that you should be outside for hours? No. Should you be outside without sunscreen? Me? No, I'm too white. So basically I live in Texas, so I need to be protecting myself from the sun as much as possible. And I'm probably getting enough vitamin D if I'm eating right. Um, vitamin D actually is one of the greatest, one of the most common deficiencies though. Um, but you don't have to be out in the sun for very long. Depending on how covered you are, it might only be 10 or 15 minutes. But again, that depends on how covered you are and you know what time of year it is. But scurvy from lack of, minerals, lack of mineralization of bones. And this is actually a picture from 1920s. I don't know how well you can see this kid. Let me zoom in a little bit more. But he has rickets. And so there he is, he's got his little like goggles on and they're just shooting UV light at him. And at first that seems like, couldn't that cause skin cancer? Yes. But right now his bigger problem is rickets. And so it turns out, um, based on these x-rays, that you can now see more mineral deposition in his bones in the picture on the left versus right. And that was taken one hour of UV radiation two times a week for eight weeks. And there's a significant difference. Like I think even on this, you can barely see little clouds here and now the bones are coming in nice and strong there. Again, he was doing one hour two times a week for eight weeks. So a grand total of 16 hours helped with that. Um, all because UV light means he can now make vitamin D with vitamin D. If he's eating calcium, he can now absorb calcium and deposit into his bones with the help of calcitonin. Thank you, calcitonin. Um, scurvy, we talked about that earlier in the year. That's related to vitamin C. Um, the only reason it was in here is it was another bone-related thing. Um, the last ones that we want to look at are, let's see, thyroid-stimulating hormone and thyroxin cortisol, epinephrine, and feedback inhibition. Um, I actually am supposed to be running some errands with my family right now, so we're gonna call this video done, and we'll have a little bit more of a third video later where we get into the bottom part of these notes. TSH, cortisol, epinephrine, and feedback inhibition. Um, if you are having problems with videos, let me know. Um, and at some point, like down in the comments section, this one, the comments should be on so you can leave comments. 
If you have questions, you can put them in the, the YouTube comments. Nobody else can see them except us. And so if you have a question about something that we taught or something else, or you just want to say hey or whatever, um, it'd be great to hear from you all. So thanks.